It's Comics Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live on Wednesdays at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time at the Ann Arbor District Library, comics.aadl.org, right on the corner of 5th and William in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. My name is Jersey Drozd, and I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, and this is the show where we talk about comics, comic storytelling, comics lifestyle, uh, making stories visually. And uh, to my right, I have the man who has the corner office on the sad life of being a comics writer, uh, Mr. Paul Story. That would be me. <laughs> because, uh, I, because I post on Twitter and Facebook apparently all the time how sad I am. You're sad, man. At He's least got according that, to Jersey. That hangdog expression, the sad puppy eyes. You're like Paul from the Beatles, right? And the, the, I, I'm, I'm the... Yeah, I'm the good-looking one. Yes, the cute one with the sad eyes. Yeah. But yes, he's ever to my right, uh, Mr. Paul Story of Storyville.com. Thanks again for being here, Paul. Always a pleasure. Thanks for being my wingman. I'm going to need you today because I'm suffering from a cold, as everybody can hear. Uh, yes, so so people are going to be forced to listen to me talking. That's uh, <laughs> Thankfully, we have two great guests. Yes, yes. They will not have to suffer you for long because we also have uh, the man who coined the name of this show on the show, on the show, Dan Mishkin. Of uh, Facebook.com slash Dan Mishkin, right? Yay! Perfectly by accident. It just kind of happened. Well, I, you haven't been on since episode one, so do we want to tell that story real quick? Well, first, we should say that Dan Mishkin is the uh, co creator of some very well known and popular comics uh, Amethyst Princess of Gem World, co creator of Blue Devil. Uh, let's see, wrote Superman, Wonder Woman. Yeah, Creeps. Creeps with creeps. Tom Hanks. Creeps. Exciting yes. horror, humor, heroes. Spell uh, game. Spell game. I forgot all about spell game. Spell game, which you worked on with uh, uh, Ramon, Ramon Perez was the artist. Of oh the my book. gosh! Yeah, one of the legends of our time. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, but yeah, yeah. What, what, what's the story about the comics? A great name that you came up with. Well, I mean, I mean, I'll, I'll just tell the 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 short version was when we were attending an event that you were you were on a panel, people talking about doing comics. One of the panelists was somebody who said, "Well." I really wanted to make a movie, but that's really expensive and it's hard to do. So I did comics instead as sort of my fallback. And I was quietly fuming at that remark. And afterward, I, I came up to you and, and said, Basically, who let that woman on the day? I mean, what, what's going on? I said, you do not have to justify comics as as a means of getting into doing movies. Comics don't have to be anything other than what they are because comics are great. Yeah, and and the way you said it though is you. I watched this uh, over thirty year old man. Uh, devolve into an eight-year-old boy when he was saying this. He just it was it was like this cheerful, explosive enthusiasm. I think comics are great. And yeah, I well, thought, that, uh, yeah, I don't don't remember that was my affect, but I could well imagine. Yeah, I, was. thankfully he didn't go for comics are great. No, no. <laughs> I, I'm in love with comics. I mean, that's <laughs> he is. Comics changed my life. I was five years old. I have an older brother who brought home uh, in an issue of of Sh uh, Sheldon Mayer's Sugar and Spike, and I opened up that comic, and my life completely changed. That and explains it, a it, lot. It really, I tell people sometimes it's like, it's like the, um, the, the Wizard of Oz going from black and white to color. That's the kind of change that occurred in my life by opening my first comic book. There's a whole world. And, and I really wish, Dan that you would rent yourself out as a comics buddy to talk with people about comics. Anybody who's ever experienced the, the sad despair that Paul Story uh, always talks about on Twitter, uh, the <laughs> loneliness and, and isolation that comes from being a cartoonist, and you wonder, why should I even do this? Why should I go on? Just talk to Dan Mishkin for five minutes, and you're going to want to punch dinosaurs in the mouth because <laughs> that's how excited this guy is about comics. So I'm excited to have you here. Uh, but I don't want to uh, take any more time before we uh, We've introduce our... Guest. We have another guest yet. Yes. Big round table today, and this is... This is one is uh, exciting to me because we got Brianne Drewhard on the show. Uh, thankfully, mm -hmm. Skype is still working. She's still with us. Uh, Brianne, uh, I I can still I can still see Dan, but it's just a frozen picture. Oh <laughs> no, that's just Dan. You guys are moving, so Dan Dan got Botox recently. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, 
Brianne Drewhart of potatofarmgirl.blogspot.com. Let's see. Let's go through some of your credits. You are an animator, storyboard artist, uh, character designer, worked on such popular things as Teen Titans, uh, Teen Titans Go, uh, Transformers Animated, and I think anybody who's been a long time uh, listener of the show knows where I stand on that particular <coughs> animated series. Are, were you going to get to Batman the Brave and the Bold? Batman the Brave and the Bold, the best iteration of the Batman cartoon franchise, in my opinion, so far. Well, that does not surprise me. Yeah, it's, it's finally getting back to when Batman yeah. was fun to, yeah, to watch, yeah. uh, for crying out loud. So, yeah, yeah, you, you're you involved in a lot of really fun stuff, and your stuff is gorgeous to look at. Also, we should mention BillyTheUnicorn.com. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so tell well, us about this. I mean, this is one of your, you know, this is not an, uh, an animation project. This is an e-book project. Oh, Billy. Yeah. yeah it, it didn't start out as an e-book. Um, I, I was approached um, at Comic-Con. I did a, a panel on children's books with some friends. And uh, Mobad, the company that put out the ebook, um, came up to me and they're like, "We would like to make it interactive." Hmm. So um, that's kind of how that happened. And uh, yeah, luckily, like, what a, I'm not exactly sure who the whole team was, but the girl who approached me, I think she was one of the lead like artists or animators on the project. So she she put a lot of like work and love into that. Um, cause I didn't, I actually didn't have any time to give them any new artwork because I was working on, you know, DC Nation stuff on the side. Yeah. So I kind of was like, I'm sorry. And I got the app and everything is alive in there. Like I still find stuff I didn't know that she had animated. Wow. Like you run your finger over the trees and like birds come out or there's robots hiding in there and <laughs> just Super amazing. Cool. Nice. And, and and it's really pretty to boot. I mean, oh, it, it's thanks. very, very, it's easy on the eyes. But we should also say that you are also, and I don't know how much we can talk about this, Brienne, but you're an Amethyst fan as well, yeah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wish I could ask so many questions, and I'm, I'm afraid to, you know. But <laughs> I, well, no, because, like, I don't know. But he mostly I, He's mostly harmless. He really is. I know. I'm more worried about about other people being like, I don't know. But <laughs> I, yeah, I am. I am a fan, and I'm. I'm very like humbled and hoping that you know I do something that at least helps the character. And I am dance. so looking forward to what you're what you're going to be doing on Amethyst. I'm thrilled. So yeah, I'm. I'm really. Ex I'm expecting to become an Amethyst fan. <laughs> well, yeah. he's downright giddy. Some respect too, so we can say this. We can say this that if you go to potatofarmgirl.blogspot.com, there's some stuff on there that refers to something to do with amethyst. How about we just th we're being coy? Uh, it's not. It's not to drive traffic to your to your blog spot, Brianne. But All, but although that doesn't hurt, it doesn't hurt. Uh, but you it's, can also go on YouTube and just Google amethyst general, and something will pop up. So mm. yeah, I got so many <laughs> at tweets from people when that video went live, uh, f saying, oh, "Jersey, did you see? Did you see? Did you hear?" Because one of the things that I do is whenever I go to um, comic conventions, I go to the back issue bins and I try to grab as many copies of this mini uh, maxi series as possible because I think it truly is one of the finest examples of comic storytelling in the 20th century, and I try to give it to everybody who will take it. Uh, and Dan's like, that, that's no pressure on Dan at all. Well, I, and 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 let's give credit where credit's due. A lot of this has to do with Ernie Cologne. Let's, who, yeah, let's give Ernie Cologne okay. plenty of credit, please. Uh, I I use I use examples from this book in all of my comics classrooms, and I push it on every cartoonist that I can find to say, look, study this. Study this is this is a, a postgraduate course on comic storytelling. This book. So the artwork uh, in that is just gorgeous. So I mean, I'm glad they're reprinting it finally. Yeah. yeah. I'm, in I'm black glad. and white, but yeah. but that's okay. Well, It'll of course, nice. at least Ernie's work looks great in black and white. I mean, yeah, you know, Ernie's like, Ernie's great. I wish that he had, I wish that he had done the entire series on Scratchboard the way he did the uh, the preview. Mm -hmm. But I I think well there there were I think issues in trying to maintain that and the stuff he did. He established a look with the scratchboard work and then he was able able to pretty much replicate a lot of that mm -hmm. when he uh 
when he went on to do the Maxi series. But man, his his stuff is just great. His storytelling is so good. He can pack so much story onto a page. And he's thinking about the characters. As I've told Jersey, one of the really interesting contributions that, that Ernie made was writing dialogue, actually obscene dialogue, <laughs> on the boards um, that, of course, none of it could be kept. Uh, partly, sometimes because it had nothing to do with the story, but it actually it actually showed me and Gary a lot more about who the characters were in Ernie's mind and what we could do with them. So he was drawing them in a particular way. He would, he did the thing with the little clasp on Dark Opal's cloak that would yeah. change its facial expression to match Dark Opal's own expression. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he would, he would really give these, these, characters, individual personalities that also came out in this obscene dialogue that then provided a lot of useful information for us. He's great. Ernie's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I honestly suspect he's not of this world. He's so good at what he does. He's the only, only cartoonist that I would give that, uh, that attribution to, actually. Uh, but, but anyway, so, okay, so we're getting to our topic here. We got a topic that we Ooh, want to we discuss the roundtable. Yeah. Uh, so Amethyst Princess of Gemworld, why, why is it that a 12-year-old boy was able to pick up this book and go, oh my gosh, this is so good? Because, uh, man, Dan, you're writing stories for girls, after all. And, uh, you know, girls well, don't... You're very in touch with your feminine side. Uh, we won't get into my J. Edgar Hoover stuff until later uh, on the I second part of the show. I wasn't quite going there, but okay. But, uh, <laughs> but, but you know, it's like, it's like girls don't read comics, so obviously uh, you must have done something where you tricked uh, little boys into reading about girls through action-adventure stories, right? I mean... Writing adventure stories for girls, how do you do it? It's got to be, there's got to be some kind of trick, some kind of secret sauce, some kind of magic thing that you do. Well, it's got magic in it. Oh, there you go. So <laughs> well, you know, as, as I mentioned to you, uh, you, Jersey, you and Brienne, just recently, I'm very aware of having tried to do a trick like that when I was writing Wonder Woman. But in writing Amethyst, it just, it just was the story that we were telling, I mean, the first question I have is, why did DC decide to publish it? I mean, I really don't know <laughs> and think that they could sell something like that in 1982. Uh, in, in fact, they, we were just asked, Gary and I were just asked to come up with like an eight page a month continuing series in a, um, uh, in one of the, the, mystery comics, the House of Mystery or Tales of the Unexpected or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we came up with Amethyst. Um, I think it must have been Jeanette Kahn who saw it and said, girl stuff. Jeanette really was all about, well, not all about, because she did, she really understood the, the, the traditional boy superhero stuff. But she, when she could promote girl stuff, she did. But what we did to make it Girl friendly, um, I think it was I think it was about believing believing in what the project was. You know, this is Amethyst, Princess of Gemworld. Start with that, and you'll get a girl comic. And you know, it's when you fight that that you have problems. I, I want to hear from a reader standpoint. I want to hear from uh, Brienne because I mean, as, growing up a fan of the comic, uh, what was it about the particular this particular story that you gravitated towards? Um, I've always kind of been into the whole fantasy world stuff. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I guess like very superficial level. Like I love fairies, elves, unicorns, all that stuff. But I also like characters that are brave and and basically can solve their own problems. Um, I think um, Amethyst, um, Amy Winston, like. It's kind of interesting because she goes to Gemworld and it's like all these royals and things, they don't know how, I don't know, maybe because they're so used to relying on magic or something. Like she ends up kind of helping everybody and like she's got these magical powers, but a lot of it comes from like growing up on earth and just using her smarts. And it's not all about like makeup or boys. I mean, it's, I mean, it's quite, it, is, it is a part of a girl's life. I mean, it's fine to have that stuff, but when it's just that, it gets really boring and it kind of gets, 
it feels forced and fake. So, I mean, the fact that, like, she's dealing with other other things, you know, and just, you know, she's just doing the best she can. I mean, I don't know. I, that's just something you can kind of relate to. You know, there's a struggle. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No, and, you know, I think one of the things that you're saying, Brianne, also is she doesn't become a... a fantasy novel character who mm. is sort of in the same way that our Blue Devil character doesn't slip right into the conventions of what a superhero is supposed to be, do, think, etc. Amy doesn't doesn't slip into like some, well, I've read Tolkien, therefore I know exactly what I'm supposed to do here kind of thing. She She complains even about, in some ways, maybe only implicitly, about being a princess. She's She's an American, you know, all men are created equal type person. So how does somebody get to be a princess? Uh, so she does take, you know, real, real world, real self, real girl in America to, to the gem world rather than being completely transformed into Amethyst Princess of Gem World. Could the, could the story have been told, uh, you know, Arnold, uh, Prince of Gem World? <laughs> well, my favorite version was Ambergris Princess of Sperm Whale, but that's, that's a very bad pun. Um, uh, I'll agree with look, that. Yeah. Could, you, could, you do a, could you do a boy who discovers um, that he secretly is the heir to great power and a <laughs> savior that others have been waiting for? Well, yeah, ask yeah. J.K. Rowling. Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> I, it sounds, sounds this, outlandish this, to me. I don't know. This particular story, um, you know, it's funny. One of the things that I, I semi feel bad about or semi regret with regard to Amethyst is the extent to which I, I think she spends too long being acted upon rather than really proactive. Mm -hmm. um, so... I really hate to say this, but I think that with a boy character, we might not have been, we would have got him up to speed maybe more quickly. So like I say, it's kind of a regret. On the other hand, it, it does describe some of what's good about the series too. Going back to that whole, you don't immediately become a fantasy hero thing. Mm -hmm. So... You know, it's kind of stereotypical to do it that way, but it is a valid and really interesting and potentially captivating way of presenting a a person coming into a child coming into that kind of world. I, I mean, that was one thing I, I did like about the comic is that she grows and she goes along. She becomes yeah. more interesting. And um, I mean, as as far as you you know, you said it, it it took you longer to get to where you wanted to in the comic. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I guess this, I guess, isn't a secret now because like DC Nation already aired. But you guys know how long the shorts are, right? They're yeah. they're a minute. They're yeah, long. they're like short shorts, right? Yeah, and um, I know Lauren Lauren Faust in her Io9 article or her interview for SDFS. I know she mentioned like how you have this limited limited amount of time. We couldn't fit. She couldn't fit everything she wanted in her shorts, mm -hmm. but she. She did a really amazing job with the time that she was given. Um, I think with the Amethyst short, um, because we don't have a lot of time, mm -hmm. uh, we had to we had to work out some stuff just to get to like, you know, point A to point B. How can we get here? How can we still have show personality in the character? You know, I mean, sorry, I'm like stuttering. No, it's a, no, it's a real it's a real problem. And even though I said, gosh, it took us a while to go where we meant to go, we were told we had 12 issues. And that was it. Because although DC was oddly agreeing to do this girl comic, they said, we can't really imagine that it's going to last. So tell your story in 12 issues. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, we were also you know, constrained in that way. But constraints, you know, are wonderful. Comics are, in many ways, very constraining because of the size of the page, the need to, uh, to, to do dialogue that doesn't totally interfere mm -hmm. with the visual storytelling. Mm -hmm. You are 
hemmed in from the get-go, and yet you can be liberated by that. That's one of the things I really love about doing comics, is that it, it has that, that strange uh, find, find liberation in constraint aspect to it. I, I so, used, do it in a minute. You can do lots of things in a minute. You can win basketball games, I'm told. But. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. There's a lot. You can, I'm, I'm kind of amazed how much stuff we were able to get in or sneak in. Um, I mean, just like, I mean, there's, you can like layer things, you know, you can have something going on in the background or just like maybe just a hint of something. And um, hopefully it's enough, like when the comic gets re-released and people pick it up, they'll be like, oh, that was, that's referencing that or mm -hmm. something, you know, like, you know, I mean, there's things that, you know, we had to kind of obviously gloss over or we didn't even have time to touch on but hopefully it's enough of a gateway drug that they'll be like i have to pick up this book and like oh i wish we could have seen this happen but there wasn't enough time but i get to read about it yeah. so. what were you gonna add paul oh i was just I, I was thinking about what dan was saying about the constraints of comics i used to get uh a lot of people when i was doing the dc animated uh universe comics um, the Batman Beyond, Justice League Unlimited, and Gotham Girls. Um, I used to get people going like, "Oh, well, doesn't it really, you know, make you, you know, isn't it tough to having to work in those constraints?" And I'm like, "They're part of the, you know, no matter what you're doing, you've got some guidelines, and if you know, you know, what you're working with, hopefully you're coming up with a story that fits it." You know that you're not. I as the the example I used to use, which is funny because I don't do sports, but it's I always said like if I want to show what a great boxer I am, I don't do it on a basketball court. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was the idea that people are like, oh well, you know, don't you want to show more mature themes and things? And I thought, not here. I mean, or or at least not um, overt or uh, graphic stuff. I'm not. That's not what I'm. I'm. I'm trying to get. Here. Or, or like uh, promoting like a cynical outlook, right? You, you can't fight city hall kids, so don't even try. Yeah, the that's end. Right. The end. <laughs> oh, that's life is life is yeah. yeah, life is despair. Give in. That was in the Amethyst Annual, actually. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> I, I do want to. I want to ask this. Okay, so you're talking about uh, SBFF, which is is it? What, what's the full title of the series that's coming oh, out? Have they? It's uh, oh no, that's been that's been she's she's close to that. It's uh, super best friends forever. Ah. There's been some art that's been uh, passed around, uh, Lauren Faust style, uh, Supergirl, Batgirl, and Wonder Girl, right? Yeah, yeah. Look, they look amazing. It looks like it's going to be an incredible show. I'm really looking forward to it. I mean, I I'm I don't identify myself as a brony, but I am a fan of the My Little Pony uh, uh, Friendship is Magic show. Yeah. I think it's fantastic. Um, but hey, hey, hey maybe now we'll. Oh, we got Batgirl on on a cartoon again. Maybe we'll get some Gotham Girls to finally be. Released. Yeah, maybe maybe some Gotham Girls. Dan, comic. Dan, you give me hope. <laughs> Amethyst is finally coming out. I think. Ah, you, yeah, know, you know, another well, well, another fifteen years. You know, they could re-release well, Gotham 30, Girls. Yeah, that's okay. That's, uh, yeah. If if I mean I I don't know what the future holds, but if DC Nation does well enough, maybe who knows? Maybe maybe DC or Cartoon Network will be like, give us more, and then maybe we can branch out farther. How amazing would it be? Watch it. Yeah, how, how how fantastic would it be if DC started making lots and lots of comics for kids? Oh man, that would be incredible. But I, I know they make some. Don't I, don't get I, me started. I, I was just gonna say that's craziness. Yeah, I know, I know, because kids don't read comics either. Women don't yeah. read comics. Kids don't read comics. And uh, and girl children? No, <laughs> girl, oh. not not those girl children. Yeah, girl no, children I, I, don't I wanna, read comics. I want to dig at this because this is this yeah. is interesting. Somebody is bound to say, "Well, gee." Boy, girl, doesn't matter. Just write a good story, and the audience will c gather around. Like Harry Potter, mm -hmm. boys and girls both like it. But come on, super, super uh, best friends forever. That's aimed at girls. It's got to be. Look at it, right? That's not aimed at the guy with the sloppy Joe in his hand, and then the copy of um, oh, of oh. Maxim in the other hand. It's it's in good okay. hands. Um, like she she did post on Deviant Art. So I hopefully like won't get in trouble. But I did a storyboard for her, for SBFF. Uh huh. Mm. So um, I like yeah. It's it's just it's fun. It's goofy, and I don't think you have to be a girl to watch it. It's definitely like if there's a guy that like My Little Pony, they'll probably like SBFF too. It's not like like I said the whole thing where like girls do their hair and makeup all day. Like 
I don't think that's going to be the main theme of SBFF. I mean, they're superheroes. They go and punch people and save people. and Right, right. You know, and they work together. So I, 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 I don't know. I'm looking forward to when those finally start airing soon. So. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Eli, Eli Nyberg is in the chat, and he says, My Little Pony shows that aimed at girls, in air quotes, is no longer a deterrent to boys if it's a good show. And totally yeah. agree. Yeah. But what I was driving at there, what I think is an interesting question is, knowing that it's aimed at girls, what, well, how do you aim at girls? Right? Like, oh, what, what, what are you thinking? What's your thinking process when you say, like, I want to aim this at girls. What am I going to put in it? Oh, well, obviously I got to put in lipstick and fashion and, uh, you know, pretty high heels and the cute boy with the swooshy blonde thing in front of his hair. Right? Uh, Alan, I mean, Alan M. from uh, Josie and the Pussycats. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. So, I mean, like, is it, w- I'm wondering if we can put our finger on a few of the kind of thinking process that we go through when we're saying this needs to be aimed at girls, or am I, am I asking a very dangerous question? I don't, I don't think so, but I, don't, I think it's simpler than, well, for me, I think, I mean, maybe I'm just naive, but I think, I think the trick is to treat girls like, a human, it's a, per, a person. You treat them the same like boys. Like, I mean, we're all we're all people. We all enjoy the similar things in life. I mean, that comes first. Right. I mean, I, I think that's the mindset you have to have. I think that's probably one of the reasons Tony's done well. And I mean, I've I've pitched I've pitched a couple of things to networks, and I've had people straight up tell me we don't want girl stuff. We don't want a female lead and they'll be like, well, we want you to focus on the side character because he's a boy. And it's not like, cause they hate girls or anything. It's mostly, and this is kind of weird. It's, I mean, it's kind of sad that it all comes back to merchandise or toys. Cause they don't think girls like action figures or toys. Like, it's just strange. So you're saying mm-hmm. girls don't like dolls. No, <laughs> well, that's what I mean. Yeah. And like, I don't, it's confusing to me. I, oh, mean, my, I mean, and the other thing too is like, why would you market to only half the world? <laughs> yeah. like, you don't like money, you don't want both, you know. But well, you know, I mean, I mean, culturally, there's there's a very clear thing. There's um, let me let me speak as a white male for a second, but but a a white non Christian male, so maybe I get a little something here. If you're if if the standard of person is white Christian male, which in many ways it is in our society, then females will read about males, but males won't read about females. Yeah. Minority races will read about white heroes, but no, or, you know, you'll plenty of black people watch white TV, not nearly so many white people watch black TV. Right. And, and, uh, all these white bread Clark Kent, Bruce Wayne characters were created by Jews, you know, like me, right? They're, they're, <laughs> they're, and, and Jews will read about the M1 standard white male Christian, but there are maybe fewer, um, fewer of the majority folks who are going to be interested in, in the other. I- so, so it's not appealing to half. It's based on an assumption that the half that has power, the half that counts, will, uh, if the stories are told about them, then the other half is just going to have to pull themselves along and they're going to accept that that's the society they live in and that's, they're going to have to make that their story too. I, I think know? that's that's interesting because uh, Scott McCloud talks about how, uh, in understanding comics, and especially in manga, how they go very generic with the the appearance to try and make it more universal to make it, it they over sometimes even oversimplify to try and make it easier for somebody to kind of pop themselves in and i and i just was thinking that idea that you know that there's a, a default of mm-hmm. you know wasp um uh wasp male uh like then people tend to think of that as generic Right. You know, like, oh, well, everybody can project onto that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I just, I, I mean, it's kind of crazy, but I think that's interesting. Everybody that, uh, should be me for a day. No, it's just I, everybody but, you know, can but that's understand. Culture and that's yeah. business. 
it doesn't answer Jersey's question. If you're going to tell a story about girls, hopefully four girls, what do you do? If you assume that somebody may buy it, like Jersey and I, in fact, are developing a project now. That's what? Pretty much what? all girls. Yep. And, you know, we've got an agent who thinks he can sell it for some reason. But Whoa, are we allowed to say that? We, well, that you think I'm you could sell it? Names. We're working uh, on a project. Okay, yeah. okay. That's cool. Aren't we? Aren't we allowed to say? Well, Maybe you should get Brianne to do covers. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm not name. I'm not naming names. What's that, Brianne? I said, if you need anything from me, let me know. <laughs> oh man, done and done. So <laughs> I'm. I'm a facilitator. I'm no, afraid. We're a long way. We're only at the beginning of talking about this project. But you know, when I think about what we're going to do with this, and when I think about how I worked on, on Amethyst and, and Wonder Woman. You know, the starting point is they have to be real characters. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I, the, when I was talking before about Amethyst not becoming your standard fantasy character, but remaining Amy Winston, girl from slightly upstate New York, you, they have to be who they are, that, that, kind, of, that kind of integrity. Um, and, you know, my Wonder Woman was, I don't know, she was, well, basically, she was a girl whose mother didn't like her boyfriend. You know, that, was a, that was a big part of Wonder Woman, uh, the dynamic, the kind of character dynamic of what I was doing with Wonder Woman. Part of making that work was to solve the Steve Trevor problem, which I... I paid a lot of attention to, mm -hmm. and I'm told by people that they thought I did a good job. But, you know, my model for that was um, was Modesty Blaze and Willie Garvin, if you know the Modesty yeah. Blaze yeah. story, right? right? And, uh, well, uh, bring, bring listeners up to speed on that. Yeah, so, you know, Modesty Blaze, a comic strip, also novels, also very odd movie in the 1960s. Very um, odd movie. Uh, with, with, uh, with Verna Lisi as Modesty Blaze, I believe. Anyhow. The um, um, was it Terrence so Howard this... as uh, as Willie? What's that? Wasn't it Terrence? Uh, no, uh, what's his um, it's Zod? Wasn't he? Wasn't he Willie? Terrence Gar Stamp. He might Stamp. have been in that. I, I, I think he I was. Know. I think he was Willie Garvin. I only know him as Chancellor Valorum. Thank you. Very oh, sorry. Much. <laughs> anyway, sorry, Dan. I didn't mean <laughs> to. No, so, so Terrence <laughs> plays. She's uh, you know, that was around for years and years and years. Uh, so she starts out as kind of a uh, displaced person, war orphan, who then. She's an operative. She's, you know, spy, thief, thriller, savior so sort of person. And she's the star. She is mysterious. She is sexy. She is smart. She is strong, powerful. And her sidekick is this hunk of a guy, Willie Garvin. And there's, it, there's never any question that modesty is the star and Willie is the sidekick, but they're fully realized people. It's not a big deal that she's the leader, you know, mm -hmm. and he's mm -hmm. the follower. And, you know, that makes... So I think that one of the things that people might do if they're going to have a strong woman is to say that, well, that means the men have to be weak. Oh, that's and like then that really, means... The... That's this, like, really sexist, yeah. automatic yeah. idea that people have if you avoid that if you if you avoid making steve trevor in in the case of wonder woman a guy who is emasculated because if he's with a strong woman he's yeah. got to feel emasculated yeah. but if you say what that doesn't make sense then you can actually do some interesting things so for me it was important to work on steve so that he'd be a a, a strong solid character that the boy readers were going to care about. Uh, but in fact, I think it was, the goal was that they're all characters you care about because you relate to them because you, you understand them. Um, well, let's, let's talk about Teen Titans for a second because Brianne worked on that and there was that big kerfuffle, what, six months ago or whatever. No. Uh, yeah. With this whole Starfire thing where, oh, yeah. remember that? That was just trying to make uh, her more alien. They were just trying to make her a stronger character because she kissed whatever boy she wanted to whenever she wanted to. And there were no repercussions. And then there was that article that somebody posted where their seven year old daughter, 
uh, was reading the comic and she was a fan of the Teen Titans cartoon and she didn't understand why Starfire wasn't actually doing anything. And anyway, it, it's all old story. But my, what I wanted to go is, is let's talk about Starfire as a character in Teen Titans, uh, the cartoon, right? Very yeah. strong character, but also a character who is full of emotion, very sweet. Very uh, excitable. Very excitable. Yeah, right? I have to say, like, I actually don't have a favorite Teen Titans character from, from the show. I, I actually love all of them, but <laughs> she's always the one I gravitate towards drawing because she is so emotional. Like, she's got all these broad movements. I mean, I... Uh, I wish we would have had time to do more of an arc with her or something. Like, I would love to have seen, like, her and her sister, like, breaking out of space prison or something. <laughs> <laughs> like, just ripping things apart. But, um, yeah, that actually reminds me. Um, I I spoke at a character design class at CalArts a month or two ago, and that Starfire, the DC Starfire thing came up. And when I when I went to college there probably been about 10 years, there was about five of us girls in, in, our, design, in our animation class out of like 70, 70 guys. But to the character design class, it was mostly girls. Hmm. And the Starfire thing came up. They all read comics. And the second one of them mentioned Starfire, there was like fire and flames. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> girls so like, what did they do to her? And I was like, oh, calm, calm down. Yeah. You know, well... Hopefully, you know, things will change yeah. or something. Plus, and, and the DVDs are still there, and a lot of issues yeah. of Teen yeah. Titans Go and yeah. collections of Teen Titans Go are still there. So, But inter it, interesting that Brianne brought up the fact that yeah. you don't have a favorite Teen Titan. Why is that? Because all of the characters are interesting mm -hmm. and compelling in their own way, right? So, like, yeah. Raven is not the girl we're supposed to... It's like this is something I teach in my comics classes, and this is something I picked up from working with Dan over the years uh, in, in, t in a teaching capacity, is you don't put a character up on the stage just to be booed at. You, if, if you're writing... One of the uh, terms that Dan taught me that I th I'm really grateful for is emotional honesty with your characters, and not just, like being honest with your own emotions as an author, but having a real empathy for every character on the stage and giving them a reason to do what they do so that yeah. the readers will care. This guy doesn't just, even if it's a guy that's just there to be a bad guy, at least make him endearing and engaging yeah. in some way or another, right? That, that was actually a problem I ran into with Gotham Girls because three out of the four issues were villains. Yeah. And, and each issue focused on the villain or, or, you know, the individual character. So... I they still had to be bad, but you still had to feel, you know, identify with them or feel bad for them or, mm -hmm. you know, have a sense of that it's not just, oh, well, you know, Catwoman is Catwoman because she wants to, you know, she wants to steal things or Poison Ivy wants to kill people or Harley, Harley Quinn's just cuckoo crazy. She likes to hit things it, with a big hammer. Yeah, there had to be more. Yeah. And, you know, I, I kind of explored that by doing little flashbacks with their... Um, with their origins and stuff, and but I, you know you had to try and bring a certain amount of humanity, um, and 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 sympathy to these characters who are in you know are technically the people like you say you're supposed to boo. I want to get Dan Mishkin's input on this uh, in a second, but first I want to hear from Brianne because yeah. when we talk about the Teen Titans, and I just want to see if you can maybe map a little bit in a uh, in in a broad sense. Uh, what do you do to get into, like, you talked about Starfire and her expansive gestures. So when Starfire feels something, she really feels it, right? She's not just happy. She's like Starfire happy. And if she's enjoying ice cream, she's enjoying it only as Starfire can. Can you describe for any, you know, we got a lot of people who listen to the show who want to be cartoonists, want to be st visual storytellers. Could you maybe describe the process of getting into those characters? How do you get inside those characters and empathize with them to understand how Starfire's body language is going to be different than Raven's? Um, well, I mean, I guess to give credit where credit's due, like, I, I didn't set that up originally. Like, I started season two on Titans. Like, Glenn Mayer Cromie and the, the writers, like David Slack and Rob Hoagie and Amy Wolfram. I, Amy. I was going to say, you work with Amy, didn't you? I, yes. I got to meet Amy a couple of times out at, um, out at Comic-Con, and she's a good her. friends with people I know. So, yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I, no, I, know, I, I, I love with her. I love her. I, I always end up working with her off and on on different things. So, 
Yeah. Um, but yeah, they uh, anyway they they were the ones who set up the the the, the personalities for the characters. So when I started, like Raven was already an introvert. Like Raven has to keep control of her emotions because right. if she like her and and Starfire are kind of a foil for each other a little bit in that way. So I mean. Um, it is, like, I do take into consideration a personality of a character before I draw it. I mean, when we do designs for animation, um, at least the way I was told to do it for TV, we don't usually put them in a lot of poses because um, we want overseas to go off of the storyboards and emote. Usually if you put the character in a pose, that might be their, like, overseas, if they don't have time, they might just stick them in that pose, so it might not fit with what's going on in the scene. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. But um, when I am drawing them for myself or for boards, um, yeah, you do have to be aware of how the character would act in that situation. Like, um, yeah, like the whole ice cream thing. Like, if Raven was eating it, she probably could not. You know, she would just be like, "This is this is good, I guess." You know, like <laughs> she's not gonna. That was actually a pretty good, Raven. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Whereas, whereas with Beast Boy, it'd be a very different thing, too, right? Uh, yeah, like, he'd be hyper and probably have it on his head or something. <laughs> or if it would fall on the ground and he would turn into something like a dog that can't eat stuff off the ground anyway. Yeah. Oh, that's true. <laughs> yeah. See, see? I, I just had this image of uh, Beast Boy and Starfire just, like, going to town, like, on a gallon or one of those, like, five-gallon things of ice cream. Uh. <laughs> And it's going to be a gross flavor, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. speaking of, like, gross ice cream flavors. <laughs> oh, okay. So the first year I went to Japan during Christmas, we went through um, this place called Namja Town, which is all this cat themed, But they have a section where it's all these, like, hundreds of different flavors of ice cream. And I went with some of the, my, my, my friends at work. And they decided they were going to buy all the weird versions. So they bought, like, beef tip, beef tongue ice cream. Mmm. Ice cream, uh, squid ice cream. I can't remember all of them. Oh, D- Dan lit up at that. Dan, yeah. Dan loves some squid. Yes, he does. Well, let me the squid. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, actually, those a lot of those guys were board artists on Teen Titans that I was with. So like, oh come on, Brian, try it. And I'm like, no, it's okay. I'm just gonna eat my like awesome like pecan ice cream. You guys, <laughs> your beef beef tongue. You didn't even try them. I know. I did try the beef tongue and like. This is my growth analogy. Like, you know when you go to a barbecue and then you eat your food and there's still, like, a layer of of meat and then there's not enough place and they just throw another vanilla scoop on there? Uh-huh. Yeah. So That's what it tastes like. like. Oh, it's, like, weird. Oh, oh, Brianne, you're so raven. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Nicely done, Paul. Uh, <laughs> this, this, this Paul story moment was brought to you by Geritol. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I want to hear from Dan now on this. On this speaking whole... of Jared, all <laughs> speaking... <laughs> Let... I want to hear from Dan on this this emotional honesty thing. Like, how do you get to this? Like, because uh, gosh, we spent so much time talking about this in the past and the different stories we tried to develop. Right? Is how do we get to what the the character's honesty is, and what does that even mean? You know, it it, it seems to me that all of us have a tendency to tell stories that we've heard before or read before. We fit them into, you know, categories. I go into classrooms and I'll talk with kids about writing and about stories they might want to tell. And you'll often hear stories that have already been published, essentially, or pieces of them, because they're influenced, and it's great, and they tell them with enthusiasm, and and that's really wonderful, but I think even when we're, you know, allegedly professionals, we're, um, we're drawing on, on all of those things, and we're, we're, we're telling, we're using the old tropes, and we're, we're telling the stories we've told before, and it turns out to be very hard to have your character react as herself or himself to the particular thing that they are facing right at that moment. Because we have all this stored up, well, this is what would happen. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about the emotional honesty in a character, it's, for, for the storyteller, it's resisting the path of least resistance, I guess. Um, it's saying, 
it, it's saying really what is going to happen now. Why, why would Amy Winston become, you know, somebody, who, a, a character out of Dungeons and Dragons who's grown up in the Forgotten Realms when she grew up in Hudson, New York, right? Um, she shouldn't. It, really, you have, you, you have characters who suddenly speak in bad Elizabethan dialogue <laughs> because somebody thinks that that's supposed to happen. And really, that character would be saying, what the, or yeah. whatever, right. you know, make your character, believe that your character is a real character is the biggest thing I can say ab about Jersey's question. Believe that your character is a real character. They're not you, or at least not entirely you. They're not all those other characters that you've read. Integrity. Be, let, let them really be who they are. Let that drive what happens. Sometimes you have to change the impetus that they're responding to because, you know, you thought it would get the response that would lead you wherever the story needed to go. But you know what? This character wouldn't respond that way. So you better back up and give them something else to react to. Because mm -hmm. if they're not reacting as them, you're losing your audience, really. And, and you have to spend a lot of time ahead of time kind of thinking about what... what they are who they are you know that's uh, um sometimes people want to rush into the story you mm -hmm. know when yeah. they're starting a project they're like oh i got to get to the story and they're not necessarily taking the time to think what makes this character unique what you know they get the ge general idea and then they they start to run off run off with it but like you say you to to know how your character is going to react you have to dig into that character to start with um, and really right. and, build. And sometimes, sometimes you have to write it wrong first. Sometimes you, you can dive into the story for a while and then you go for a while and you say, you know what? Now I know who the character is. I'm going to start over. Um, one of my <laughs> teachers, uh, the, the writer Kate Wilhelm, uh, talked about that, about how, you know, you may think you know where your story begins, but you might really go for a long time before you find yourself at the place where the story really begins because you have finally figured that stuff out. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can figure it out by thinking about it or you can figure it out by writing it. But ultimately, you have to be willing to throw out a lot of stuff if you take the, if you take the second approach, figuring it out by writing it. Right. Brianne, um, how many attempts does it take to get a really good set of storyboards? <gasps> uh, <laughs> oh, I felt that. Wow. I felt that sigh. <laughs> oh, for me, it takes a lot. Like, um, I, I feel like storyboarding is definitely not my strongest muscle. Um, I didn't start boarding. I didn't start boarding professionally until a couple of years ago because I could not find design work, and there was a lull in the animation um, business a little bit. So um, that's actually why I started on Brave and the Bull. They were short on board artists and. Michael Chang, who I worked with on Titans, decided to bring me on and kind of train me and help me. So I, I really cut my teeth on, teeth on Brave and the Bold. Like, um, but it would take me, I would try to do four or five passes of thumbnails mm -hmm. before I would um, find, like, finalize on a board. I would turn it to my director and it, like, he had so many revisions for me because like, I, I was learning everything. You know, like, and it was such a quick, speedy deadline. Um, well, I, I did uh, I did the first board for Amethyst, and I think, how many times did I redo that? I can't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what but are you I, redoing? What are you redoing? It's like, because, uh, you know, there's people in the chat who are listening really hard right now because they, they are very interested in storyboarding. <laughs> Uh, and yeah. are, is it a is it a, a drawing them right kind of thing? Is it a, a viewing angle thing? Is it uh, you know a cho moment choice thing? What what are you redoing when you're doing multiple uh, passes? Cool. Um, for me, it's just trying to figure out where everything goes, and it's it's almost like juggling, like because you'll get a script, and you know they might say like fight happens here in warehouse with barrel or something, and epic fight, but. And it might just be one little paragraph, but that fight might need to go on for two or three or four minutes, mm -hmm. and you have to figure out flush things out. And the other thing too is the amount of characters. Like, if it's just like one or two, oh, that's fine. But like, I know on 
Brave and the Bold, and luckily, like, they didn't give me too many fight scenes since I was still fairly new. But you'd have, like, five or six characters. You have to keep track of them all. You know, you have to also think, like, you know, if if there's the Flash, like, you have to take into consideration what their powers are. Like, how are you going to take out this character? And, you know, if there's any plot points. I, I feel bad. I, I feel like somebody else would, like, day leave or somebody would probably have a better <laughs> way to explain it. But, um, no, but what you're, what you're describing, it sounds to me like you're saying that you have to, you're kind of uh, acting as an agent in the, the actual execution of the story and thinking about yeah. if, if the Flash... You have to act for it. Yeah, you, you have to act for the characters, right? Mm-hmm. So like if, okay, let's say you take the Flash from Justice League Unlimited, and so the Wally West Flash, the good Flash as it turned out. <laughs> oh, no, he didn't. I love Wally. <laughs> I love Wally West, but uh, but anyway, so okay, so how's he going to disarm Lex Luthor as differently than say John Stewart Green with Lantern his with his charm? With, well, John Stewart <laughs> Green Lantern is uh, an uptight Marine, right? And then uh, Wally West is way more laid back, and he always has to have some kind of panache to what he does. So you got to figure that into the acting moment. You got to figure in like uh, you know what is the viewing angle? Am I going to look at it from down low? Am I going to look at it from up high? Lex Luthor walks into the room and he's very menacing. Okay, well I'm going to look down at him. Why doesn't he not look menacing? Right? Yeah. Oh, I'm going to look up at him now. Oh, and suddenly he looks menacing. Oh, I'm going to put a I'm going to rim light him. I'm going to put some light behind him. Now all of a sudden he looks even more menacing. Why are you making that face at me, Paul? I'm just fascinated. Oh, because I, I'm on a, I'm on a tear. Uh, but anyway, so like, there's a lot of moment choices that go on in here. Whether you use your viewing angle, and then also in storyboarding, this is where it gets really interesting. Is in comics, it's static. In storyboarding, now you get to do panning and trucking and zooming and figuring out. Okay, we're going to start here on Beast Boy's hand holding the flower. And we're going to zoom out to show that he's standing on a junk heap, uh, offering the flower to somebody. Right. I mean, a lot of subtle acting and other things that you can add that just will tip off the viewer with more with, with what's more that's going on. Like things that like the dialogue might say this, but you could do something to give it more more meaning. Yeah. Um, I'm <laughs> so sorry. Well. I, I want, yeah, I want to hear from Dan on that. I mean, in terms of like how the dialogue marries with the images as well. I mean, now we're getting into like general storytelling stuff. General storytelling is he a new new project with Dan? Yeah, Jeff. general general storytelling. Yes, <laughs> he's, he's he's the villain. He's <laughs> yeah. I yeah. I, I actually I, I need to digress for just a moment because something was suddenly making me think. We were talking about these characters. How would this character do that, et cetera? If it's if it's this character against Lex Luthor or whatever, so I I really have to give credit to uh, to someone uh, who you normally don't think of as gets credit for great characterization, but I'm going to give credit to Julie Schwartz, who is thought of as a plot guy, totally a mm-hmm. plot guy. But one thing Julie said to me when he was asking me to do a Superboy story was. The plot for a Superboy story can't be a plot that would work in a Superman story. Oh, yeah, right. You know, so that that idea that that you really are talking about different characters who are operating out of themselves came from really, of all people, Julie Schwartz. And I love Julie, so I don't want to sound like I'm disparaging him. But, you know, he really was this kind of crazy idea factory in a lot of ways. Um, but but he really did understand how how characters work. Um, maybe <laughs> maybe he didn't understand dialogue entirely. He changed one of my jokes in a Superman story. I will never forgive him. For that. Uh, but <laughs> but he's not bitter, and that's what's important. Go back to DC Comics Presents number fifty one, and uh, you will find a a baseball joke and. The baseball joke that I had was funnier than the one Julie decided to replace it with. But that's okay. Um, so dialogue and, you know, you know, one of the things about writing dialogue, so I keep coming back to this word integrity, right? And, and I think that's what we're all talking about. Brianne, I think it's really what you're talking about too, is that, that, that the keeping it real approach but also the idea, and Jersey and I have talked about this a lot, that anything you do is serving the story. The mm-hmm. story that's 
supposed to be the sort of the, the platonic story that you're trying to get to as, as as nearly as you can. You know, if you stop to show how clever you are as a writer of dialogue, or if you stop to show what a beautiful line you have in, you know, or, or what amazing detail or curlicue or whatever you can produce and wow somebody as a technical feat as an artist, you are throwing away the real job. Oh, man, I got to jump on this because this is like this yeah. thing where these days, like so many people think the effort has to show. Um, I was once talking on another podcast. I was guesting on somebody else's podcast. and I brought up that Amethyst page that I always use in my classrooms. It's from Amethyst, Princess of Gem World, issue two. It's uh, page five, I think. Uh, it, 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 it's Satrina is is using a spell to uh, turn Granch and all the other uh, guards into trees, and and Ernie Cologne did this thing where oh Dan's Dan's gone to get it. Dan. I'm <laughs> either, looking for it. Either that or you know he might have to take a little break. That's a... I'm pretty sure it's issue two. Uh, but uh, anyway, he does this thing where he um, Ernie Cologne used panel three and panel five with one image. He, he man managed to make one image into two panels in the story by the, this different kind of trickery that you can do in comics. And I love using it in classrooms because it's what I consider to be an example of pure comics. No other medium can accomplish that. Use one moment for, for two moments, mm -hmm. right? Um, and as I'm showing it to these guys on this comics podcast, one of them goes, boy, it's just too bad he doesn't do very good backgrounds, huh? Uh, and, and I was like, really? That's what you're going to get hung up on, is that in panel one, he, there's no background. There's just a wash of color. Because I'm like, does that matter? Well, we, and, we know and, where they are. And so often, actually, so often when you get the hyper-detailed backgrounds, I mean, you know, people think, oh. oh there it is on the screen. Dan's putting up. Can you hold it steady, Dan? I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little too old to hold things steady, but oh. I'll try. And there's a bubble yeah. yum ad next to it. Yeah. Can you... I'll Can put it, I'll put that? I'll put a link to it in the show notes as well. But yeah, there it is, uh the, the page of Granch getting uh turned into a tree. Turned into a tree. And so he's responding to Satrina in panel two, but then we see the dialogue continuing into panel six or panel five or whatever, where uh Carnelian is taunting Satrina as the guards are all being rooted to the ground. Uh that's why And this... the, and the dialogue is going is going in and out of panels. I know. Yeah. Right? God, it's so such a you, great example. Um, so that it's just, it's very fluid in a way. And Jersey, as you and I have discussed, I don't recall that either either Ernie or I, and I was writing the first pass of the dialogue on these, I don't recall that either Ernie or I stopped for a moment to say, how is this technically working as story flow? Oh, you could drop We're it out, Dan. responding to each other yeah. and, and making it work. Right, right. Well, I mean, that's just it. It's like when you're in the moment and doing the creative work, and I'm sure all you guys can back me up on this, you're just in the zone and just doing it. And it's only after the fact we back up and go, oh, and you look at it with like a, yeah. a, a the cooler eye and go, hey, the kid was onto something there. Uh, but when you're just doing it, you're not, you're not magically just say, ah, I'm, I'm going to defy traditional reading direction today. You know? <laughs> you know, you're just trying to solve a problem whenever you're do working on the page. And then the, the, that's where the creativity happens, right? You know, and I think that going back to the, the question about storyboarding, which I can't do, um, but, you know, as, as you talk about it, Brianna, as I talk about this particular page in Amethyst, and, and as you have people who are wondering, well, gee, how do I do that? And how you do that is really do versions of it over and over again until you have these, these techniques in your bag of tricks that really are second nature, that you don't have to think about. They're just there, and you've iterated and reiterated so many times it just comes and it's the next thing to do isn't isn't this what musicians and dancers and athletes do all the time well that's and that's that's like uh, uh you know this a uh, very common thing uh, my my writing professor my favorite writing professor in college said uh and he was quoting somebody too it's like you got a million mistakes you might as well get them out of the way yeah <laughs> and and I, go, yeah. go ahead I, I, I mean i i keep a sketchbook i, I draw on it every day i go through a, like a sketchbook a month and um, experience-wise, like when I started on Brave and the Bold, the board, the board that I did for Amethyst, it wouldn't have been at that quality if I hadn't been doing boards the last couple of years because I've learned so much since then. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the whole thing with the stuff being so short, you have to problem solve. Like, 
well, how can I fit this in here? But I need this to happen. Well, maybe I can combine these two. And then it ends up being like, okay, that actually worked pretty cool. And I, I, I know some of uh, my friends who, who helped with some of the other boards and stuff. We all had to problem solve. Like we all, we all talk to each other um, just to keep track and, and to, um, if anyone needed any help or figure anything out. So there was a lot of cases where we had to kind of combine elements. I, it's kind of hard huh, to explain without showing. I can't show anything. But <laughs> well, maybe like, with with you know, any luck, character and with any luck, we can actually get you to come out for our kids read comics celebration, and I then you could do. teach us how you do it by showing <laughs> us in person at an actual be, workshop. That would be great. And and for those who were, I guess, are just watching Brianne speak, uh, Paul in Jersey and I were were nodding very vigorously. <laughs> yeah, the whole time. <laughs> that you were saying that stuff because that experience is very familiar. Uh, yeah. Well, well, guess what, guys? Um, we are on to book recommendations segment. We're going to close in the next couple minutes here. And uh, very uh, the AADL ninja quietly <laughs> crept into the room. Uh, you guys didn't hear him coming. Oh, oh yes. your, your mic's not live. Oh. We'll see if we can see if we can get Matt in the in the. Okay, right. Matt just notified us that that's Eli much, is live and that's direct. How much of a ninja, that's how much of a ninja I was. That <laughs> I, you, the you, microphone turned so itself off <laughs> in deference to By me. By the way, somebody earlier said, well, you know, Eli's coming. And I'm like, oh, so we have to hide, hide your heart now. Hide your heart now. What? Right. You see how rapidly he responded to that, Paul? Which means that that was another Geritol moment by Paul's story, everybody. Also, I get... You know, you got that, right? And I have all the story jokes. <laughs> yes, of course. My entire yes. life. So yeah. I, I, I was sympathetic there. Well, let me let me state that I only know about the Eli's Coming song because of people from other generations <laughs> continually wow. throwing it in my face. Didn't, so, didn't you see the great episode of Sports Night? <laughs> 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 is this something I'd need to own a TV to under? No, just kidding. Oh. Yeah, no. I've heard yeah, Sports Night is a great show. Yes. All right. So, I, I Eli, sports, I, I, I know <laughs> Eli's got a lot to add to this discussion and, and oh, recommend man. a few things. I do. And, you know, the, as, as I've been listening to your to the conversation today, there's so much great stuff. And, you know, I have two girls who read comics in my life. My wife is a, is a big comics fan and my six-year-old daughter is also a big comics fan. And to me, the only thing you have to do to make comics work for girls is not have superheroes in them. Uh, that's <laughs> like, I mean, girls aren't uh. interested in power fantasies. You know, that's the thing that I really found. And, you know, it's like that the, the storylines, the conventions of superhero comics, I mean, and, and not to say that there isn't a female audience for superhero comics, mm -hmm. but like when you think about why do comics not always resonate with a mainstream girl audience, you know, there are plenty of comics that do. They just don't have we power even, fantasies in them. We didn't even talk about manga this whole time. I'm surprised yeah. we didn't bring up manga. I've got a couple here in my list. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, part of it is is just, and, you know, I also learned a lot about this from the, the Pokemon stuff that we would do at the library. You know, the boys would all be like, oh, fire defeats this. You know, they'd, they'd throw out these really huge overpowered Pokemon. they get their butt kicked because they didn't know the type matchups. The girls would have a much more nuanced view as to which Pokemon were really going to work. They didn't go for the big, powerful, flashy moves, and they would often... They would often win, <laughs> so you know it was a it was an interesting uh, interesting juxtaposition. But as a result, I brought just a few book book recommendations from our collection uh, that uh, I, I actually decided not to be limited by stuff that was actually on the shelf. So I brought wow. a couple things just to kind of semi show on my iPad. However, this is all on the web at aedl.org slash go slash girl comics, and so that's uh, a shortcut to this list that I made. So one of them, this is my daughter's favorite book. Not sure if it shows up on the camera there. It's called Toys in the Basement. It's by Blanquette with a Q. B L A N Q U E T. And it's not shelved as a graphic novel because it's in that great area of kids' graphic novels that librarians don't consider to be graphic novels. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, you know, um, Captain Underpants and, and, yep. uh, and yep. uh, uh, what's the other thing? The Ook and Gluck, the caveman thing. You know, where it's like, yes, they're, they're totally graphic novels in form, but. They're, they're not always, you know, they're shelved often with the rest of the fiction. I, I yeah. ran into that. My last recommendation was uh, for uh, um, uh, Allison Dare. Uh, yeah. And I found it shelved at my local library in the in just the juvenile fiction right. section. I was like, because I was like looking through the graphic novels saying, oh, it said right. that it was in, but. And then where is the it? Wrong, yeah, looking in the wrong place. So this is a book yeah. called Toys in the Basement. And it is totally a graphic novel, completely informed, beautifully hand-painted. Uh, and what's really interesting about this, it is a super dark story. I mean, and it's, you know, it's, 
It's like Sid's house, you know? I mean, it's Sid's house without mm. the sadist present. Toy but Story, it's the same yeah. sort of like, ooh, there's something wrong in this home. Mm. Somebody's escaping to a world to get away from something. But it's for kids. It's my six-year-old girl's favorite book. Mm. Despite the darkness and sort of like the, you know, the, uh, oh, what's that called? Hylozoism, hylozoism the belief that everything has a spirit. Oh, um, okay. You know, like, and it's the Toy Story thing, which yep. I don't know about you guys, has made a lot harder for me to throw away toys in my house. <laughs> thinking about, you know, <laughs> oh, man, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be in the incinerator, teary-eyed someday. <laughs> oh, man. So this uh. is Toys in the Basement. I recommend this highly. It's a really, really fantastic book. The other one that I wanted to be sure to mention is a nonfiction graphic novel. It's written by a woman. Is str- illustrated by Brooke Gladstone. It's the oh. influencing machine, uh, Brooke Gladstone on the media. And if you haven't read this, this is one of the most fantastic nonfiction graphic novels I've ever read, and I've read a lot of them. And this is, uh, you know, Brooke Gladstone is a host of NPR's On the Media, and this is her first comic project. And as a media pundit, she took it extremely seriously to understand the form, and she's working with, with an artist. I'm, I can't remember... Uh, where is uh, Josh Neufeld is the uh, artist who she worked with. And, you know, he would tell her the limitations of what he could realistically pull off in the time frame. But basically, this is about how media influences culture and culture influences media. And it has some really horrific stories in there. Uh, not like just as far as like ways in which the media has inadvertently changed history. Um, like for example, the report about uh, the report about Hitler's rise to power, and an interview with a a former World War One general uh, from you know fr- from Germany, that mm-hmm. if it had been published by the right newspaper, would have been seen all over the world and could have prevented Hitler's rise to power. You know, I mean, that, that kind of like what if sort of you know, uh, what's the historical non or historical fiction inspiring yeah, yeah, yeah. sort of stuff? Alternate universe. That's right. Yeah. So Brooke Gladstone, <laughs> the influencing machine. That's another one. Now on the flip side, and this is in the uh, non superhero department. This is definitely the kind of like uh, I'd call it, you know, the girl cash in kind of comics. This is Baby Mouse, which is a series that's Big one, fairly yeah. popular. Yeah. I mean, it's it does a lot of sales. It's very. Uh, you were talking a little bit earlier about you know make it look like it's worth your time baby mouse doesn't look like it's worth its time it's very quickly put together you know you, you it's it's marker lines it has a very kind of it doesn't you know, look strained right no. it, it doesn't look like the it's, yeah like what dan was talking about earlier this kind of like the, the let me show you what a genius i am with a pen right exactly yeah. and the stories are very simple but they're also pretty well calculated to appeal to really young girls four five six seven year olds mm-hmm. um and you know there's i mean yes this is cupcake tycoon so there's a little <laughs> bit of a power <laughs> fantasy going on in there but it's also a uh it's just it's a really nicely put together little series. It's light fare, and clearly the uh, the executives involved made sure there was pink on the cover. And this uh, reminds me of the story of why Princess Celestia toy is pink. Do you guys know about this story? Oh, uh, I do not. Okay. And I was wondering about this. All right, so uh, you know, Princess Celestia is a white horse. This is you know indisputable fact. Yep. Right. Okay. Watch the show. Prettier like that too. Definitely, <laughs> my Princess, personal taste. I, well, and and you know, white horses are something amazing. Yeah, pink horses are everywhere. You know, and it's not like there isn't already a pink horse on the show. You know, <laughs> I mean, there is a pink horse on the show. Her name is Pink Pinkie, Pinkie Pie. pie yeah. You know, so anyway, there's. The, I was finally trying to find out because my daughter would ask me this question: Why is the Princess Celestia toy pink? That's stupid. You know, and it's like, I don't know, baby. I don't, let's, so, of course, like, you know, if all you have to do is Google, why is Princess Celestia pink? And you find a forum where Lauren's saying, you know, that's beyond my reach. Yeah. The, uh, and, and she said that the manufacturer, basically, that was solely on feedback from the retailers. The retailers said, if it's pink, it'll sell. If it's white, it won't. Make it yeah. pink or we won't buy it. Oh, so, you know, I, I'm sure that there's the book buying equivalent with the cover of Baby Mouse yeah. making that the same case. <laughs> Yeah. And then, you know, I mean, of course, Bone is, uh, you know, Bone is legendary. But what's interesting about Bone is that it has an unbelievably strong female character who is not, you know, for girls by design. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't think Jeff Smith set out, I'm going to write a comic for girls. That's a you good know? example yeah. of something where you can clearly tell that he wasn't saying, the, this is my target mm-hmm. audience. Right. right. Yeah. Right. It just so happens that he wrote a really strong, realistic female character. Who also has a power fantasy, you know? Mm. I mean, she gets really powerful toward the end of the comic, mm. and uh, but it, it was always interesting to me how much my, you know, the girls in my life, both both my wife and daughter, were yeah. into Bone because of it not being, uh, it didn't require as much suspension of disbelief, 
you know, because these weren't human th- people doing human things, or they weren't all humans, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it just it was such a compelling story. I mean, even before we had kids, we were by and bone every every issue, you know. We weren't even waiting for the trade paperbacks. But what's most interesting about the way that my daughter reads comics is that what she's really into right now are the, the cinemanga versions of all the Miyazaki films. Hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, where they take stills from the film and right. then re cobble it together in comic yeah, book form. Yeah, and you know, as a, as, a, as a comics person, you're like, what the hell is this? Yeah. You know, this is, yeah. uh, how much of a cash-in could this be? But for her, she can take the time over the story that the movie doesn't give her. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, that's one of the things where I get really excited about comics as a medium is that the reader gets to be a participant in the pacing of the story. Dan and I have argued in the past about whether or not we are in control as the authors, and we do have a certain degree of control, but ultimately we don't have full control because you can the reader can zoom back, forth, all over the right. place. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah, that's one the, of the The job things. is to manipulate the reader as much as we can, but... <laughs> right. Excellent. <laughs> Whereas with film, and I once I once had two film buffs really give me a hard time about this, and I said that as opposed to film, which is, uh, in my opinion, a more of a passive experience because you're right. not in control of what you're seeing at any given time. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so continue. So these cinemagas. So, you know, and the thing that's, and of course, I mean, I kind of consider Miyazaki as the gold standard of female characters. I mean, none of... You know, none of his movies, well, some of them are kind of, uh, Kiki's Delivery Service, you could say, is for girls. You know, mm-hmm. but it's, you know, but it's not, it's not exclusive. You no know way. I mean, I mean when, yeah. when Tombo's hanging from that blimp at the end, yeah. I'm right there on the edge of the seat with everybody else. And when, right. the, when everything goes silent just before that yep. big moment, oh man, it gets me every time. And what I love about that is then the movie's over. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's like, here's a climax. All right, thanks, credits. <laughs> and on all of his movies, you know, yeah. but... I mean, and especially the way that he's so... We just saw Arietti. Have you guys seen Arietti I haven't yet? seen it yet. So, um, you know, to digress into movies a little bit, but, yeah. you know, it's, it's very similar to a lot of his films in that it's a coming-of-age story that is shown and not told. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And, mm-hmm. it, and especially, you think about that, in Kiki, like the one scene where she's walking down the street and she sees the older, slightly older girls looking in the window and laughing. Yeah. It's like, there's nothing said about what she's feeling. Right. You know? It's just... You just understand that, and and all that stuff, and I think that that's really the stuff that resonates with my daughter, is seeing because these are even the witch is a more human character than anyone in most of the media properties that she's being exposed to. Yeah, you know, I mean, Kiki's got problems that almost nobody on TV ever has, <laughs> and it's really, int- you know, she's like not sure of her place in the world. How many shows are about that? Right, you know, well, uh, Perfect Strangers. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I, well, yeah, That's it's, right. It's more like bulky is metaphor. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Aren't we all a little bit like bulky? A uh, little. <laughs> <laughs> no, Dan. Dan, I think you could speak to this uh, in, in the chat here. Cartoon Fun Time is saying I never liked superhero adult male oriented comics because the art wasn't full of appealing shapes, accessible character designs, etc. Man, did we not just have a discussion with somebody about whether or not a certain story that we may or may not be developing would benefit <laughs> from having a more cartoony style, given that we want it to appeal to girls. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. that's definitely right. It's the, um, you know, so Eli, I take a little issue with the idea that superhero stories are all about the kind of power fantasy that you're talking about. Sure. I think they're very often, and when they're at their best, they're they're about a fantasy of how you decide what to do when you have power, which is a, a very different kind of story. I think, and I think of that again now because that off-putting nature of some of this superhero art is is exactly that. It is about raw and 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 almost ugly power uh, and bursting with with un power unmediated by by emotion, morality, intelligence, or anything like that. Right, so that's why what we'll call a cartoony or a Bigfoot style, I think, is going to is going to have the kind of appeal, or at least it's going to avoid that kind of off-putting nature. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, well, like like the new Shazam design, the Captain Marvel design. I don't know if anybody's seen that yet. I haven't seen uh, it. No, no, it's it's the new Shazam. It's the design. new Shazam, and he's yeah. he's uh, once yeah. again now we've created a hero who can't say and his own name. Somebody took his Maalox, <laughs> and he's really upset about it. I don't know why he's <laughs> all crouched <laughs> in a corner. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> why it's hard because I can't really see what's going on in that too. It's so much of it's dark, like you yeah, can't yeah. see his face. 
<laughs> so I'm kind of like, okay, he's got a hood, so maybe there's more going on in, that we're not seeing. Yeah. <laughs> it's all in the gamma, <laughs> right? But well, it's not yeah. CC Beck, huh? No, it's yeah. not, unfortunately. Right. But, you know, and different times, I guess. But anyway, I want to wrap this up because, you know, the Ann Arbor District Library spends a lot of money to put this show on, and I want to be respectful of their resources. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, gosh, we will have to get this roundtable back together again uh, in the future I, because... But, I, I think that's great. Oh, yeah. okay. Maybe, maybe, I was agreeing maybe with you. Maybe fall after, after the new, after Amethyst gets re-released. Well, and... I think, I think by then, hopefully, some of the shorts would have aired by then, too. Well, we'll also so, talk about maybe if seeing if you would be available in July to come out for Kids Read Comics, Brienne. I think that would be awesome. Are we going to do a uh, live I, I, kid... Co yeah. Comics are great uh, from, from the... Probably. Yeah, excellent. I, I think we'll be doing some live broadcasting from that. So Yeah, but, but Brianne should definitely come out. Yes, Brianne, we'll, we'll talk. Uh, and But anybody who wants to talk with Brianne can find her at potatofarmgirl.blogspot.com. Uh, you also have a portfolio site. It's just briannedrewhard.com. Uh, while and there's stuff missing so i apologize <laughs> if someone goes there and they're like what is going on with this site like it's my friend like that really well i haven't had time to update it <laughs> so well but for for more uh you know timely yeah. updates they can follow you on twitter at potato farm girl right it's probably the best to ask me questions at actually yeah so because yeah. it's so fast and immediate it, it's um, easier to respond i'm following brian now and she's following you. Yes. Uh, but yeah, it's, it is easier to, to uh, address fan questions that way because it is so short and it's limited, and you don't have to worry about writing a novel. I was know? gonna say, but limit limit them to you know not the, now this multi power question. Yeah, no, none of that stuff. Just ask a simple question if you want to ask, her, or just tell her that you really liked seeing her on the comics, a great show. So then she'll come back. That'd it's be probably cool. better than emailing me because I'm I'm really behind on emails right now. I, I know people have been asking me questions, and I just don't. I'm. Like, this week, I think my life is going to start going back to normal. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's really that good. like? <laughs> Been really busy. No, I'm 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 the worst at email. I'm right there with you. So uh, you are, but, but you really, really I, are. I, no, I am. I am. Yeah. I, I admit it freely to the public. It's like if you want to get like I have to direct message you to get yes, yes. get response. I, yeah. It's easier to get in touch with me via Twitter. I suck at email. So um, well, email's how you talk to old people. So you know, I mean, that's <laughs> again, <laughs> yeah. again. I noticed that Paul's emails are always in all caps and there's no punctuation. <laughs> <laughs> so so not true. <laughs> I, oh, that especially the punctuation part offends me deeply. <laughs> Sorry, because I'm one of those people going like, really? You, Twelve you commas? Hit, yeah, you couldn't hit the shift. Yeah. You know, you can, well, and plus I'm like the king <clears throat> of parentheticals. But, but uh, Brianne, thank you very much for making yes. time to be here because she's on the West Coast, and so we, she had to get up early for this. And I, I d really, really appreciate you doing that for us. I so. To go to work soon. Yeah, yeah. So. Work. Oh no. Yeah. But but then I want to turn to Dan Mishkin of uh, best place to find him is facebook.com slash Dan Mishkin, right? That's the best place to see my collection of Superman toys, yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the man has a Superman themed bathroom. And when I saw it, I came home, I told my wife, I want a Cybertron themed bathroom so bad after seeing Dan's <laughs> Dan's Superman with, bathroom. With 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 yellow <laughs> Red and blue tiles. Yep. Yeah, you're saying he's flush with Superman memorabilia. Oi, here we go. Oh. But but Dan, thank you. What's that, what's that, Brian? I said I want a themed bathroom too. <laughs> well, I tell you what, come back to Kids Read Comics in July, and we'll, we'll show you the bathroom. We'll all go see Dan's bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Field trip. Yeah. Okay. And then we have. Paul Story, Storyville.com. Thank you for lending your voice to the conversation and you know, uh, being uh, with My you. pleasure. And, and for and all of... Storyville on the Twitters. Storyville on the Twitters as well. And Dan Mishkin on the Twitters. And then, Eli, I'll miss you most of all. Uh, Ulo Trickus on Twitter. Ulo, tri uh, Ulo Trickus on line. Ulo.trick o Trick o .us. <laughs> there we go. And at comics.aadl.org for uh, any other things that you need to uh, no. make a mention of no. going on the library? Cool. No. Well, thank, thanks for letting us do this longer show today, hey, too. No Appreciate problem. it. So thanks, everybody, for listening and watching this show. It was streamed live at comicsaregreat.tv at uh, Wednesday at 1230 p.m. Eastern Time. And it will be collected later as a podcast at comicsaregreat.com and comics.aadl.org. Comics.aadl.org. That's where you can get the video podcast feed if you want to watch the videos after the fact. So check it out there. And thanks, everybody, in the chat. Uh, until next time, I've been Jersey Drozd of comicsaregreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. 
Okay, bye. Hey, hey. <laughs>